Hello and welcome to another episode of the 8-Bit Guy. Today I'm going to show you four vintage digital cameras and these do not use memory cards. Some of these use floppy disks, some use super disks, and even 3-inch compact disks. Then I'm going to take you around Dallas and show you some interesting landmarks uh, using these cameras to take pictures. Okay, so the first camera I want to show you is the original Sony Mavica from 1997. By the way, the term Mavica actually stands for Magnetic Video Camera. So this is my friend Brandon who runs an antique reproductions furniture store and uh, I met him through the synth meet because he's heavily into synthesizers and keyboards like I am on my other channel. But uh, he is also an original owner of a Sony Mavica. And since I never actually owned a Mavica back in the 90s, um, I wanted to have Brandon here to tell you about his experience of actually using one. Now, before I can talk too much about this, I need to set the stage with a little history lesson. In 1997, you can easily say that 99% or more of the population was still using film cameras, with only a tiny percentage using digital cameras. So we were at that stage where the early adopters were buying them, but the general population just really couldn't see the point yet. They were happy with their film cameras, and the digital cameras were pretty expensive, and they didn't know where they would get their you know, prints made. and. But really, the biggest challenge, I think, for most digital camera users of the 1990s was simply figuring out how to get the pictures from their camera to their computer. This was a typical computer that someone might have in 1997. Most people were still running Windows 95 or even Windows 3.1 on their PCs, and the Macintosh was only a few percent of the market share. One thing you might notice is that it has no USB ports. You see, USB didn't exist. Well. Technically, it was invented in 1996, but it wasn't really available to consumers until around 1998, a year after the Mavica came onto the market. And even then, 99% of the population still did not have USB on their computers. So in 1997, there were a handful of first-generation digital cameras on the market, and nearly all of them required use of the serial port in order to transfer photos. So serial ports, they always had like IRQ conflicts and all kinds of software problems. And of course, there was no native operating system support for these cameras. So you would have to install proprietary software and drivers in order to use these cameras. They often didn't work right. There was lots of problems. And each camera was completely different from the next camera. So there was no standardization in how anything worked. If you had a laptop, you might be lucky enough to get one of these devices that allowed you to use a memory card and insert it into a PC card socket of your laptop, which appeared as a native storage device for the computer. I don't believe any such devices existed for desktop computers. So the beauty of the Mavica was that you could take your photos and then remove the floppy disk and insert it directly into your PC and copy the files off, because every computer had a floppy drive back then. And if you compared to a roll of film, you could typically store 20 or 30 exposures on a roll, and if you were going on vacation, it was probably just as convenient to carry around a bunch of floppy disks as it would have been film rolls. I mean, even these old Kodak disk film cartridges only had 15 exposures on a disk, and the Mavica could store around 20 photos on a single disk. Not only that, but unlike film cameras of the time, it was possible to review your photos and then delete the ones you didn't want. I distinctly remember about half the photos I took on my film cameras ended up in the trash after getting them developed. So, you know, everybody's used to their uh, cameras on their phone, and they just take pictures of everything. But back in the days of film cameras, you, you know, you had 24 exposures on a roll of film, and you were pretty conservative as to what you took pictures of. You, you didn't just go around shooting this, that, and the other. You're like, oh, okay, this is a good shot I need to take a picture of. Um, but with the digital camera and having the uh, convenience of the floppy disk, you know, I was going around just taking pictures of everything. And then once I filled up the disk, I either popped a new one in or I'd take it to the computer and dump it to the hard drive. So, yeah, I was taking tons of pictures. And in my business, uh, in the furniture business, you know, pictures are important. When I've got customers in other cities, uh, I used to have to draw stuff on uh, on a piece of paper and send it through a fax machine and hope that uh, hope that they could figure out what the heck I drew. <laughs> but with the uh, email and cameras, yeah. 
Sony originally released two versions of the Mavica in 1997. There was the low-end FD5 and the high-end FD7. Both had the same 640x480 resolution and both had the same 2.5 color inch LCD on the back. But the FD5 had a fixed focus lens and the FD7 had a 10x zoom, which is really nice. The low-end model retailed for $599 and the high-end for $799. So, I happen to have the high-end version with the 10x zoom. Now, the first thing people notice when I show them this camera is that it's unusually large and bulky. Despite being 20 years old, there are some things that you're likely to be familiar with. For example, if you hold the shutter button down part of the way, the camera will lock the focus and wait for you to depress it the full way before taking the photo. At which point, the floppy drive will fire up and you'll have to wait as it saves your photo. It does have a flash, and rather nice zoom controls, as well as a manual focus with an actual knob. The screen does have some menus, but there aren't many options to select. Incidentally, the screen only has 165 by 124 pixels, so it's barely good enough to use for menus. And so the LCD was really just good enough for, you know, a basic viewfinder, just to, you know, know what the heck it is you're actually pointing the camera at. You know, another interesting thing is that most cameras, even from this time period, had an option to select different photo resolutions. But you'll notice no such thing in the menus on this thing. But what it does have is uh, field and frame. Now, you may be wondering what the heck that means. Well, you see, Sony didn't use a dedicated CCD sensor for this camera. They actually borrowed one from their consumer camcorder line of products. So the CCD in this thing was one that you might have also found in a handy cam that used 8mm video cassettes. So the actual CCD had a horizontal resolution of 570 pixels, but the vertical resolution is much harder to explain. Since it's designed for interlaced NTSC video, it uses two fields, which are scanned 1 60th of a second apart. So the first field is 245 pixels. And so if you have the camera in field mode, then the resolution is 570 by 245. Pretty simple. But if you put it into frame mode, it will also capture the second field, giving you a total of 570 by 490 resolution. So regardless of the mode, it would always interpolate the images up to 640 by 480 resolution. Now that resolution doesn't sound very good, but really it wasn't too bad considering at that time uh, the typical screen resolution most computers were running at was 640 by 480. And for example, if I display a photo from this camera, it actually fills the entire screen on this computer because, well, that's the native resolution of this laptop. Let me show you an example of a photo that I took in field mode. You can see there's a lot of jagged edges around this area here. Now, here's the same image taken in frame mode. Looks much better, right? So you might ask why they would even include the field mode in the first place. Well, uh, the reason has to do with the way the CCD is designed to scan two fields a few milliseconds apart from each other. So if there's any motion, it'll turn out blurry in frame mode. In fact, if you notice when I turn on the camera flash, it automatically disables frame mode because the flash only lasts long enough to illuminate one field. So I wanted to show you a few more photos. So I decided to take a little trip. In a previous episode, I showed you some landmarks of Dallas-Fort Worth. And today I'm gonna show you some interesting places in Dallas. Unfortunately, it was totally overcast on this Sunday in November, so here's me arriving at Dallas City Hall. Fortunately, they're closed on Sundays, and I took advantage of their EV charging provided in the parking lot. It may not seem familiar on this side, but the other side should look familiar to you because it was the headquarters in the 1987 movie Robocop. So even though Robocop is supposed to take place in Detroit, it was actually filmed all in Dallas. In fact, you can clearly see Reunion Tower in the backdrop of this car chase scene. Incidentally, Reunion Tower was also destroyed in the movie Asteroid. But don't worry, Reunion Tower is still here and I can safely walk through these passageways at City Hall without any fear of being attacked by a giant robot. And look what I found, an old vintage payphone. Now this relic ought to be on my channel. This is a historical piece of technology here, isn't it? I haven't seen one of these in ages. Okay, so here we are at the Dallas City Hall, which you've seen in the RoboCop movie. And uh, it looks a little bit different because they put a matte painting to make it look like it was taller than it really was. But it's still a very interesting architecture. And um, I'm gonna take some pictures using my uh, vintage uh, floppy disk cameras and we'll see what it looks like. Anyway, I set up a tripod, and here's a photo I took on the Mavica FD7. 
I also took some other shots of some of the surrounding areas. So I thought I'd be an ultra hipster and take my 20 year old vintage digital camera to the Dallas Auto Show. Now the irony here is that I'm using a vintage camera to take a picture of a brand new piece of high technology, the Chevrolet Bolt EV. So the photos really aren't that great of quality by today's standards, and honestly they weren't even that great by the standards of film cameras of the era. I went with the Mavica, uh, with the FD7 mainly because of the floppy drive and the instant gratification that being able to take a picture on the camera, popping it out, popping it into the computer, emailing my customer a picture of a piece of furniture, you know, that, that was to me the way to go. So if I went with a scanner, you know, those guys were around five to eight hundred dollars and they were better quality. You could get up to 300 DPI resolution for a full page. But you still had to take the pictures with a film camera, run them down to your hourly, uh, you know, one hour photo developer, and then come back, look through all the pictures, find the one that you like, scan it, and then email your customer. But, you know, with this guy, you could take five pictures and you pick the best two or three. I can email my customers, you know, a new piece of furniture that just came in, and hopefully I've got a sale. Okay, now I want to move to three years ahead and see how the Mavica evolved. This is the FD85, and while it's very similar to the one I just showed you, it has some very important evolutionary changes. For one thing, it has over four times the resolution, now clocking it at 1.3 megapixels using a CCD that is dedicated for digital cameras. Let me show you how much better these photos look that were taken with this camera. It's amazing what three years could do for this technology. I would really say this is a threshold where digital cameras quality surpassed film cameras, at least for personal use. The hardcore photographers held out um, another few years with film. Another interesting feature of this camera is that it has a 4x speed floppy drive. So listen to the old drive and how fast it changes tracks. And now listen to this one. That's pretty interesting because in all the time the floppy drive was in use for PCs, nobody really ever attempted to make the drive faster. You know, I guess there just wasn't much of a need, um, but when the uh, camera came out and people didn't want to wait around for the to take the next photo, I, I guess suddenly there was a need, so I guess there was a reason to make it faster. This camera also introduced the ability to use this nifty device. It's a floppy disk adapter that takes a memory stick and it can be inserted into the camera. Now unfortunately this will not work with the older Mavicas because the firmware has to know how to actually use this, but this allowed the Mavica to store a lot more photos. So you might ask if you could stick this thing into a regular PC's floppy drive and read it like a disk. Well, the answer is yes and no. So you see it required a special driver to be installed and um, the only driver I can find uh, that works with this is for Windows XP. So um, also it requires an actual uh, computer with an internal floppy drive using the original standardized controller. So that really limits the number of computers that you could use this on. So for example, there's no way you would ever be able to use it with like one of these USB floppy drives even if it were running on Windows XP because it's not a standard controller. The camera also included a composite video port so that you could play back your photos on a TV so the whole family could see them. Another interesting feature added was the ability to take movie clips. Now the resolution was very low at 320 by 240 and the clips could only be a few seconds long because the floppy disk simply can't hold very much. But still, that's certainly something your film camera couldn't do. So you would have needed to bring a separate video camera in order to do that. Okay, so here's a really rare camera I want to show you. This was a competitor to Sony's Mavica. It was made by Panasonic and it came out around 1999, around the same time as the last Mavica I just showed you. Now the major advantage this camera has is that it uses the LS120 SuperDisc format. Now it can use regular 1.44 floppies, but I mean, who would want to use that when you can use these futuristic looking super disks that store 120 megabytes per disk? I mean, you would need 84 floppy disks in order to store the same amount of data as a single super disk. So you'll notice that using a blank floppy disk, it says it can store one movie clip, 17 low res photos, or five super fine photos. 
Now with a blank super disk, it says you can store 90 movie clips, over 1500 low res photos, or 480 super fine photos. Now one huge disadvantage to the LS120 format was that most computers could not read it unless you bought an LS120 drive and those weren't cheap. So in a pinch you could still use a regular 1.44 floppy if you needed to. So one of the uh, interesting things about this camera is I can turn it over to PC mode. And at that point it just becomes a storage device. It'll even work on my modern computer. And it just mounts itself as a disc and I can drag the files right off of it. So with the camera plugged into my PC like this, it really just becomes an external LS120 SuperDisk uh, drive just like this. So it, it kind of takes the place of having one of these. It, maybe it's not as elegant to use, but hey, it works. Now unfortunately when I went to Dallas, um, I accidentally had this camera set in low resolution mode. So the pictures don't really do the camera justice. But at least I did get a sample of the video clip mode. So I did take a few extra photos around here in the proper resolution to give you something to look at. This is a 1.3 megapixel camera, very similar to the second Mavica that I showed you. So the one annoying thing about this Panasonic camera is its size. I mean, it's the biggest of all four of these, and, and all four of these are really too large in my opinion, but uh, this one is particularly bulky and it's not something I'd wanna be carrying around and using a lot. Okay, so I wanna jump ahead another three years, and this camera represents the very end of the Mavica line. And as you can see, they have ditched the floppy disk in favor of a three inch compact disk. Now it can use regular CDR or CDRW disks, so naturally it could hold quite a bit more data than a floppy disk, and yet still maintain compatibility with most computers of the time. Of course, today, most computers don't actually have optical drives. All of the computers I have around the house are slot loading drives, so they can't mount the three inch discs anyway. In fact, the only computer I could find that could read these discs was this old iBook clamshell of mine that has a spindle that I can manually pop the disc onto. Now the great thing is with this camera is it does support USB, so it really doesn't even matter if you can read the discs because all you gotta do is plug this into your modern computer's USB port and I can actually drag and drop the photos right off of this camera without even needing to take the disc out. So some interesting aspects of using a CD for this is that you have to tell the camera to initialize the disc before you can use it. It warns you that you have to set the camera on a stable surface before doing this. When you're done with the disc, you have to finalize it if you want to be able to read it in a computer. However, if you use the USB to grab photos, it's really not necessary to finalize the disc. And uh, while you can use any disc in the camera that'll fit, it'll always complain and suggest that you use the special Mavica branded CDs. For example, this one actually has the Mavica logo on it and it seems to like this one better. So what about the photo quality? Well, it is three megapixels and to be honest, even though this camera is 13 years old, I think the photo quality actually holds up very well, even by today's standards. And actually, I've said this for years, that I think three megapixels is really the limit to good photos. This is my opinion, of course, but I think three megapixels is roughly the threshold where it's really good enough for most uses, especially when viewed on a computer. And I think adding more megapixels beyond that you get kind of diminishing returns. You have to really add a whole lot extra to really be able to notice any difference. And, um, you know, a lot of the cheap cameras, especially the ones with plastic lenses and whatnot, they can't even resolve more than about three megapixels into focus on the imager. So I've seen cameras before that have 10 megapixel imagers, but you really can't see any difference in detail between three and 10 megapixel settings on that camera. This camera also has a 3x optical zoom, so I could use this as an everyday camera for both work and play. That is, if I didn't mind waiting for it to uh, write those images to the CD. And of course it does have video clip capability. It does 640 by 480, but the image is very soft and the frame rate is pretty low. But it is the best video quality of the four cameras that I've shown today. Okay, so I've got to open this old box of Kodak disc film. I haven't seen one of these in ages. Look, the uh, expiration date was in 1990. Wow, I, I haven't opened one of these in a long time. I don't even think you can get these developed anymore. Well, there you go. There's an old Kodak disc cartridge. Okay, so... 
which of these four cameras is my favorite? You might assume that I would immediately jump on this one because it is, after all, the best and most advanced camera of this group. And if for some reason I was forced to use one of these cameras as my daily work and pleasure camera, well, this would be the one I would naturally pick. However, to be honest, I have no reason to do that um, because I can just use my good modern cameras or even my cell phone for that matter. So my actually, my favorite camera is the original Sony Mavica FD7 uh, because it is the most, I think, collectible. It's the oldest and it's got the, the most unique qualities to it. Speaking of collectability, I only paid $15 for this on eBay. In fact, I didn't pay more than $15 for any of these cameras. Um, there seems to be uh, quite a few of them around. Well, with the exception of the Panasonic SuperDisc camera, this one was hard to find. Uh, but it still didn't cost very much when I did find one. Uh, but the other cameras, the Mavicas, they're, I guess they just made so many of them. They're, they're actually really easy to find. I think they'll be good collectible cameras in the future. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, and as always, stick around because I've got more stuff coming up. All right, so this is my friend Brandon who runs a actually originally owned a Mavica. I'm only kind of in the 1990s um, I thought <laughs> I need a blooper roll on this one.